Welcome to the podcast Studio Stain, Inspiring Leadership. I learned in my life the importance of being inspired by others and to be surrounded by people who bring you new insights and perspectives. That is the way to grow as a leader and human being in challenging and changing times. In this podcast series, I bring you the latest innovations on personal development and leadership told from business managers, CEOs, spiritual leaders, and people who live their true story. Welcome to the, to the podcast Studio Stain. I am your host, Stain Stas, executive coach and addicted podcaster. And today my guest is Louis de Canier. Let me introduce you to Louis. Louis is an impact investment professional. He has an impressive career in the financial world as chair of the supervisory board of Incofin, a large investment company that is active all over the world, where he was also the CEO for 22 years. He is director of the Finance Trust Bank of Uganda, yet he is also the chair of the board of directors of Ceres SPTF, and that is a non-profit organization dedicated to social and environmental performance management. He is also the author of the book, Africa, A Dream Future. Luwik started his career with a bachelor in philosophy and a master in economics. Luwik's main goal is to improve life and working conditions for people around the globe by making investments that have sustainable and global impact. And in this podcast, we dive into the topic of money, sustainability, how to make impact in the world, and Luwik will share his views on impactful leadership in a drastically changing world. So welcome, Luwik. Very nice to, to have you in my show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, and... What I found when when we met and I saw your um, your career also on on LinkedIn, you have been traveling so much and you have been all over the world working with so many people and making so much difference in uh, for so many people. So first of all, I want to say thank you for all the work that you have been doing so far and thank making you. this big difference for people. It is amazing what you have been doing and uh, I feel that you have a lot to share. And so let's dive into it. And I'm sure you can inspire many people. So my first question, uh, Louis, is, you know, your life is about money and making difference. How did does that correlate for you? Where did it all start this? Because money is often considered as something, something dirty or not good. But you make you seem to make a lot of difference with it. Where did did it start for you? It's an interesting question. So. Um, I'm indeed an economist, um, and for me, um, economic science and econ economics is about trying to improve the life of society and the life of as many people as possible. Mm. Um, and so I, in my uh, previous career, I also was chief of staff of the minister president of the Flemish government, and he was also minister of economic affairs, and I was in charge of... Uh, um, economic affairs within his uh, his team, uh, and it was a period of very high uh, unemployment in Belgium. Mm. And so we very much focused on trying to um, turn around that situation, to create more employment, to make sure people would have access to jobs, because this is what uh, provides stability uh, and fairness um, in a society. And so I think um, economy is about um, inclusion of people in the economic system, uh, enabling them to uh, have a prospect for themselves, for their relatives. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is very opposed to another view on economy, on economics, which is about how can I get as rich as possible in uh, a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think economy is something very noble. So it's mm -hmm. a very noble uh, science and a very noble um um, instrument, uh, but it should be used what it is designed for, which for me, okay. uh, yeah. including people um, and, and building a, a stable society and a fair society. Yeah. Did you have that view when you made the decision to go and study? You had this social drive already when you, when you decided to engage to this study? Yes, def definitely. I mean, um, I studied economics in Louvain, 
um, and very much uh, selected um, a specialization which was on international economics and uh, north-south relations and fairness. Um, and I made my license, uh, my, my uh, finals, uh, what do you call it, dissertation about mm -hmm. uh, redistribution of, uh, of work. Wow. Uh, yeah, as a tool to uh, reduce unemployment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. And it was with, uh, with uh, a person, a professor from Louvain, who then became minister um, in uh, one of the governments. Uh, Frank van den Broeke is his name. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was very much driven to uh, yeah, creating more fairness and uh, equality. Mm. So, how how did you end up? Uh, because of, uh, how did you end up? You said um, you worked for the minute for the ministry, and then you started your own company. How how did that go? What was the decision point? To there was yeah, there was something in between. So um, after the ministry of the cabinet. Um, I joined a company called Dredging International, which is a big marine engineering company, um, because I'm also fascinated by everything which is related to uh, the maritime sector and mm. vessels and, uh, um, well, marine engineering. And so um, I was in charge of um, trying to um, uh, finance big infrastructure projects in Africa. Uh, and in Asia, that was my task. So mm. I, in that period, I started traveling a lot uh, together with engineers and they came with an engineering solution to the clients which were like port authorities. Uh, and I was supposed to find ways um, to offer a financial solution to a port authority, enabling them to build their port. Mm. And that was a very, very interesting period, um, really fascinating. Um, and uh, among others, we uh, financed a, a project in Bangladesh, which was the um, uh, rehabilitation of a mangrove area in Bangladesh uh, of Ganges, um, and that was th that became a success. But it was also a period where uh, I traveled a lot, um, came in very poor regions like Bangladesh, like India, mm -hmm. uh, like Nigeria, uh, and that's where I got the idea to uh, to change uh, my life. And when I became 40 years old, uh, I decided to yeah, start this company, Incofin, uh, and try to find a way to improve the living conditions of poor people, but in an entrepreneurial way. That was very important for me. So a bit like an alternative way to what NGOs would be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much interested in trying to um, stimulate the uh, entrepreneurial capacities of people uh, to elevate themselves out of poverty, if you like. Yeah, and that's when I started the uh, Incofin. How how was that for you when you um, becoming an employee and then an entrepreneur yourself and really focusing on following your heart? As I if if I yes. have it correctly, Correct, yes, yeah, yes, that was a very difficult period, and the mm -hmm. first three four years were extremely difficult because uh, the, the the initiative was very small. And we did not succeed in cover in covering our own costs. Um, okay. And I had an agreement with Dredging International, my previous employer, that I could go back to them uh, in case the initiative would not work. Um, but the it was so difficult to survive that I a few days per week continued to work for Dredging International just to have enough money for our own initiative to mm. survive. Uh, and that took like three four years. Um, until it then started uh, working, and then it took off, and and it, yeah. uh, it became much bigger. Yeah. Well, if if you look back at that period, what were for you the main indicators or the main criteria that made it made you to succeed and to to continue, and not just to say, okay, I give up, and you know, I go back full time to to Demi. What yeah. what were the the key the key issues yes. there? Um, so. Yeah, it was really the drive to to realize this, mm. uh, to make sure this would succeed. Because I think the it it was obvious that it could work, and the the idea made sense. Um, so not giving up was a very important point in that period of time. Um, to stick it out until yeah we became self sufficient. But I must admit it was a difficult period, a very difficult yeah. period. You had uh, and sometimes doubt. I was sorry. You had moments of doubt. Yes, yes, definitely. There were moments where I remember I called my previous company. I said, I'm perhaps 
considering to come back because it doesn't work. Uh, mm. <laughs> and then still, yeah, continue to... <laughs> who who <laughs> was your main supporter that said, no, 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 we are not going to do this, Loic. We are going to continue. Well, um, actually, Incofin had been already existed when I joined. It was a very small initiative. It had been created by Franz Friheke, who was the chair and the founder of VDK Bank in Ghent. Mm. Uh, and he was also okay. very much the driver behind this Incofin. Um, and so very much supported me in continuing. Uh, mm. and, and that's, I think that, and also the board of that time uh, was a very um, great board of people uh, providing a lot of mental support uh, yeah. to continue. Yeah. How would you describe the, the characteristics of these people that they kept on going and supporting you? What, what, what made them do that for you? I think there was a very um, clear alignment of mission. Mm. Uh, so, and, and a conviction that, yes, this is the way forward. Uh, we are talking about the beginning of what, 2001, 2002, um, in a period where this was um, very much a pilot model. It did not really exist. Uh, ten years later, um, investors st started talking about impact investment and it became like a concept, but that did not exist 10 years before. Um, and so I think that's the great thing about Incofin that uh, we worked on a concept that was hardly existing at that time, but very much convinced, yes, this is the way forward. It is mm -hmm. obvious that um, when people can improve their own economic conditions, they can make progress. Um, and yes, that's what we wanted to prove. Yeah. You had you were um, quite an innovator at that time then. Um, yes, but I, I don't claim to be the innovator of that time. I think it's uh, it, it was really the group, uh, mm. the board, and Mr. Verheke uh, together who had this idea. Uh, but I was, I think, the um, the one who translated this into uh, into fact and into reality. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and and mm. very much. Um, I mean. I worked very hard huh, that in that time, <laughs> in that period, uh, looking for investors, funders, uh, looking for projects, etc. Um, trying to convince, um, yeah, investors, which was not obvious at all because it was an unseen uh, concept and um, also facing a bit of, um, yeah, comments and and uh, um, yeah, not always very positive comments on on the on the concept. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the moment that you said, okay, now we have success, this is it? Yeah. Do you remember I think, that moment? Yes, I think that moment came when um, in 2007, so it was seven years after the start, uh, we created a fund which is uh, called the Rural Impulse Fund. Um, and um, I convinced the European Investment Bank and uh, World Bank to come on board and they accepted and I remember that I said, okay, now we have a proven concept. This is working. Uh, see who we get on board of our small funds here, the small Belgian uh, Incofin. Uh, and I think that was really very much um, confirming or yeah, uh, helping me to, to, to get confidence in, in the concept. What kind of project was it, if I may ask? So that was a, a we, we created an investment fund um, investing in rural microfinance institutions. So traditionally, we already invested in uh, microfinance institutions, so small banks that provide microcredits, microloans to uh, entrepreneurs, uh, to smallholder farmers. Um, but the concept of microfinance is something that emerged in, a, in an urban context. Okay. Um, yeah. It was not really designed for rural contexts. And so we observed that the, um, the, the biggest need for microfinance existed in rural areas rather than in urban areas. And so we said, okay, let's try to find ways and identify microfinance institutions who have the potential to become good suppliers of financial services in rural okay. areas. Wow. And that worked very well. That worked extremely well. So we were able to uh, identify uh, microfinance institutions in Peru, uh, in Colombia, in Africa, which did very, very well. Yeah. And so that, that was, um, yeah, that was quite amazing. Wow. Uh, what what I wonder then, Louis, is uh, you said okay, we we got the World Bank on board, European Commission. You as a leader of of um, of Incofin, 
what kind of skills do you need to make and to convince and to let other people believe in your concept? That's uh, interesting because I have this conversation often with uh, the young generation in Inkofin. Um, and for me, but it's my style. Um, I think authenticity is very important, mm. um, but not only authenticity. I remember um, that the investors of the World Bank and the um, European Investment Bank, I was at a conference in Switzerland and in the evening, we went in a small bistro having a dinner and it was such a nice atmosphere and a very friendly atmosphere um, that we also became friends um, and that they also um, yeah, became convinced of, of the project. And so I think the human relationship is extremely important. It's not just about pitching a proposal uh, with slides and numbers and facts and figures. It's also about the human relationship. I think that's extremely important. But that's mixed, of course, with authenticity. I mean, um, I'm not playing games. I'm I'm um, I'm not playing theater. It's what I I say is what I think, um, which is also the the most easy. No, I never have to think what did I say before or so. I, that's not how I I yeah. work. So I and and that works. I think. Yeah. Is that like always speak, speaking your truth, even if it is difficult? Yes. Yes. And. Um, that's also the, the culture uh, we developed in Incofin. It's not to hide issues to investors because things went wrong, of course, in, in, in the funds and uh, there were bankruptcies, there was there was fraud, um, there were issues with um, political circumstances, riots, uh, uh, civil war, whatever. So we lost also investments. Um, and I think what is very important is to be very transparent to the investors, not to hide anything. Then you get them on board mm. to think with you. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine that it's easier said than done to be transparent when uh, when you have a project that fails. Or Yeah, it's of course also uh, you have to admit that uh, you may perhaps misjudge the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, that's part of the game. Yes, yeah. I fully agree. Yes. Uh, yeah. how, how do you deal with that? Um, um, I'm, uh, um, yeah, I, I accept the situation. I mean, um, I, I don't like this, of course. Uh, it's very tough to do that, but um, there is no other, there is no way around. I mean, I accept that there was a misjudgment and, and um, um, yeah, share that feeling with the, with the investors. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's very important to, I, as as I see it, to accept the situation as it is, and not be blind for um, or for a belief that it can still change or or trying to hide things, but the acceptance of the raw truth that is in front of you. Yes, it's yes. Um, a beautiful skill to have, and, and also not to try to sell it in a different way. Or um, yeah, I yeah. think that's important. Yeah, but I I, I can imagine that at a certain point you. When is the moment of the acceptance and still trying to change or to find another way or to find an opp another opportunity? How do you how do you do that? Yeah, that, that you make this this we have done everything we can, or what's what's for you the cutoff point? Yeah. Um I remember that um I took all these um incidents and accidents in our portfolio very personally. Uh and I remember the very first one that we faced. Uh, we had invested in um, a company in Peru, which was um, working with a, a cooperative of fishermen, and they were fishing uh, scallops. Mm. Um, and we invested quite a lot in that uh, in that company, and it went completely wrong. Uh, and so, this was very heavy for me to to accept. So um, I went to Peru, uh, tried to intervene, still tried to correct the situation. Um, but then at a certain point of time, I could say to myself, well, I've done everything which was possible to uh, remedy the situation, but I didn't mm. succeed in doing so. So this is what it is. This is what it is. And so what, what can we learn from this? Uh, lessons learned from such a situation. What shouldn't we do in future? What we did here? What did we wrong here? 
are you a, a, a kind of um, uh, what what is your emotional reaction at that moment do you withdraw yourself and 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 go meditate for two days or just how, how do you deal with that is because i can imagine that if you it, it is quite heavy it, it, uh, emotionally it's a lot of money involved a lot of people involved um the best way i can um, um accept is uh, by going into the nature alone mm. uh, and and slowly slowly accepting uh, the situation as it is and let things go i think that's very important yeah uh, let, uh, and what do you mean by letting things go um make sure that i'm not um um caught by 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 uh by worries and by concerns mm -hmm. um and that they leave my mind, if I may say so. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I that I find back some some um, uh, quietness and and uh, mm. uh, acceptance. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful how you say, "Okay, I go back in nature, and I I need to have the silence again in 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 my in in my head." Do you do that often? I do that very often, mm. very often, almost every day. I, I go alone for. Uh, one hour. Uh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. I, I need it. Uh, because every day is very intense. Uh, and even the normal feelings of every day, I, I need some room and space and time uh, to digest uh, and to let that go. And mm -hmm. that it not would not... Um, I mean, if I have a sleepless night, it means that I um, have not been able to, to digest the situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that a kind of a, a daily ritual for you to have this hour walk? It's yes, it is a daily a daily ritual. Mm -hmm. Yes, almost daily. Yes, yes, indeed. Mm. <laughs> it's beautiful to see how, um, uh, because I, I can imagine it's 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 quite an intense life that you that you lived and and still still living. Are there any other routines that you have to make sure that I can get the most out of my day as much as possible? Apart from walking, um... yes, I I love music, um, and uh, so does my wife, by the way. And uh, so one of the ways also to calm down is um, going to a concert. Um, there's a concert hall not far from here. Uh, listen to beautiful baroque music, mm. uh, which is so quiet. Uh, and when I get out of the concert, I'm a different person. Okay, uh, what what changed yeah, yeah. then? <laughs> listening to Bach is something that for me is uh, okay. helping me a lot yes 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 mm. I find this so uh, providing so much um, quietness and uh, peace uh, of the mind yes so you go often uh, I go quite often yes yeah yeah yes beautiful what Every would you uh, what would you say if you look back at your career um the project that you are the most proud of that you say wow here this is really what i why i am doing this or what yeah. uh, where I, this is my mission the the most beautiful project yes um i think it was the the so we traditionally invested in microfinance institutions um and those microfinance institutions extend loans to quite often to to farmers small farmers and at a certain point in time, we said, okay, but um, can we not um, finance this, these farmers directly uh, mm -hmm. rather than through a, a financial institution? Uh, and that was the beginning of um, the creation of another fund, um, like some 12 years ago, which is called the Fair Trade Fund, where we started investing or providing loans to cooperatives of farmers, okay. uh, fair, fair trade labeled uh, cooperatives active in uh, in coffee, banana, whatever. Mm. Um, and that was also quite unseen at that uh, moment in time. So we started uh, discussing with Fairtrade International, the, the labeling organization. Um, and I remember when I visited these cooperatives, these are um, thousands, thousands of farmers um, with very small arable land, like one hectare, two hectares maximum. Um, but it's so... Yeah, incredible um, that we can help them to get their produce onto the world market, uh, coffee markets, cacao markets, 
uh, thanks to this financing. And there I felt, well, this is really impact. This is, mm. and of course, it's it's very small impact. Huh? And I know it's it's not changing the world, huh? um, but at least um, the farmers can have some, um, yeah, guarantee that they can um, sell their produce at a, at a fair price, um, that they have a buyer. Uh, Etc. So it, it it's slightly it's 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 a small change to the world. Yeah, for those farmers, it's a big one. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I know this is not the end of poverty <laughs> or. <laughs> no, no. Well, <laughs> it's 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 beautiful. You're too modest, uh, Loic. I think it's you. You made um, for those people. It's a big change. You no, know, it is. It is uh, in in the field for for them. It makes it it it's their living. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, I think that's uh, even if you can. Uh, I feel that sometimes we see it a little bit too big, you know, that we want to 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 clear out all poverty all over the world. But if you can al already start with one person, you change yeah. the life of one person. Yeah, and even if if that's the only thing that you do in life, you have to change the life of one person. Yeah. And I think taking these people serious is what that drives me. That's what drives me. And I need to go. I, I need to travel and and see that on on the ground, not stay too long here yeah. in the office in Belgium, but yeah. uh, on the ground and and see uh, what is the impact. Yeah. yeah. You also studied philosophy, Louis. Yes. <laughs> How did that influence your career? Well, um, I think that's or your life for that matter. Yeah, but I think th that's. Um, quite logic. No, I'm, I'm not a traditional um, master of business administration, MBA type of uh, economist. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, um, economy for me is something which has to do with uh, society and, and justice and uh, fairness. Uh, and so the link to philosophy is very close. And I was always interested in philosophy because of that type of questions. Mm -hmm. um, what is what is just, what is fair? Uh, how can uh, the quality of a, a society improve? Mm -hmm. um, that's the type of philosophy that interests me, which, mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, yeah, is very close to, yeah. to economy. And Adam Smith, by the way, uh, the founder of modern economics, was, a, was also a philosopher. So yeah. it's uh, not so far from each other, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you perceive a lot of resistance uh, against your ideas and how you want to make their uh, impact in the world? From um, what angle did you receive that? Not, uh, no, no. I don't think that there was resistance. Um, on the contrary, there was a lot of of sympathy. Uh, but but what I certainly faced is, um, uh, and this is also something you need to to be able to to digest, is a, a, a for mainstream investors and economists etc what we do is a bit um yeah marginal no it's a mm. so the condescendence of, of uh, that's something what i uh sometimes found a bit hard to to fix in, in uh, what way was that hard for you um so yeah to 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 see that uh people think that what we do is uh oh, is okay. um yeah um not really relevant yeah um uh, it's a bit um um unusual uh not really contributing to uh to stronger economy yeah. etc um yeah that's what i mm. face from time to time it, it it feels a little bit like david and goliath it I think it is no, and and because I had been um, chief of staff of the the minister president, so I know these captains of industry. Yeah. Uh, I, I met all them, uh, all of them, uh, and some of them reacted in a very favorable way, but some of them came with reactions which were a bit surprising to me. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You what should not spend you, time. What, yeah, sorry. Yeah, some some if some of them said, well, you should not spend time on this and. Is there, is there something wrong with you or uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> mm. well, or is there something wrong with them of course yeah <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah that's always the um, 
Beautiful. But that's what, yeah. what I like most is trying to build the bridge uh, between the yeah. mainstream economics, mainstream finance, and then the needs, investment needs for of poor people. Because I think it's um, it's linked to each other. These are not two separate worlds. It should be one one and the same world. Is it Which easy? is changing a lot. Huh? It's changing a lot. Yeah. Is it easy, you feel, to, to make that bridge? It's, it's, it seems like a constant battle of... Oof. Yeah. It's not easy, but I think many things have changed because also the mainstream markets have much more interest for uh, socially responsible investments, for ESG, uh, environmental social government investments, mm -hmm. uh, for impact uh, as a whole. Um, and I must say, I was extremely proud. Um, we were able last year uh, to get two new investors on board uh, of Incofin Investment Management, which is a fund management company. Um, on the one hand, it's um, the Hof Petrikam Dipam, which is a, a mainstream uh, private bank and asset manager in Belgium. And the other one is Coris, which is the family Colred, is the retail chain in Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, so I found this like a confirmation of the model. Um, and also, of course, it um, um, yeah, it provides credibility uh, to what we are doing because if these parties confirm our model, uh, it means something also to to third yeah. parties, to external mm -hmm. parties. So you said, what are for you the, the main changes that you have uh, that you have been seeing the last years um, in this in this world of finance? Um, I think there is a, a clear shift in um, understanding that um, finance and investing um, should not only be about um, creating more uh, wealth and more um, yeah money, yeah, yeah. Uh, but has a as a broader function. Um, so finance is also or could also be like, of course, for good um, and, and improving uh, living conditions and uncertainty. Of course, the climate uh, issue has, has changed a lot in, in the minds of people, I think. Um, it's still a bit difficult to talk about the social dimension. And we were initially or mainly still our social investors also um, include now and integrate the climate dimension. Uh, but I think the climate uh, crisis is changing the minds of people about how our economy should look like, um, what capital markets should do, uh, what investment should um, should achieve. What What is your view? Where Where should we go, uh, the week, or where, where do you want to go? What's your ideal yeah. vision uh, of, of this of the of a new system? Yeah, I think that um, for me it's obvious that. Um, the so-called stakeholder approach uh, should become the, the dominant approach. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, not only taking into account the direct profits of an investment or of, of an activity, but also taking into account the broader context. Um, and um, so, so what we see now, for instance, is um, even with the green transition, uh, where we all move to uh, electric vehicles and, and this kind of things. Um, I don't think that the society always realizes what this implies um, for uh, the global south. Um, mm. We see this rush to to cobalt, to, to critical minerals, which are necessary to achieve this uh, uh, climate and transition, this green transition. But on the other hand, the impact of this on the ground in Congo, for instance, Congo is a supply 60% of the, uh, the cobalt worldwide, uh, leads to uh, horrible situations on the ground where um, young miners are working in uh, horrible conditions to mine cobalt. They earn $2 per day. Uh, there's a lot of, of accidents in those mines. Uh, and I don't think that we realize and what is happening. And um, um, it's almost like, irresponsible mm -hmm. uh, we should be aware of the consequences of what we are doing and of our uh, our type of consumption or our type of investments uh, and that's what i mean by stakeholder management um, i think we will continue in a, in a capitalistic model 
uh, that that capitalistic model should be um, complemented, I think, with stakeholder view on everything we do. We can no longer afford to just uh, go for growth, not taking into account um, the, the consequences. What is needed in leadership to achieve that? Uh, courage, no? Mm -hmm. uh, the courage to really... Um, um tell um people um what is at stake and and what are the consequences of our actions um not to hide those consequences um and accept the consequences which can be that yeah products become more expensive uh, some type of products can perhaps no longer be distributed um but that in general is always in in my opinion courage no Leadership yeah. and courage are very close to each other. Yeah, I think. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, both in the world of enterprises as in the political world. Yeah. Be courageous. Be courageous. Yes. Be courageous. Yes. Mm. Wow, beautiful. Uh, maybe one more last question. We're almost at the end of the podcast, Luke. What are your personal aspirations? What, what, what do you? What is still in there for you to? To continue okay. to this, uh, I would really like to know. Yeah. I know you're working on on a translation of your of your beautiful book of Af yeah. about Africa. Yes, well, yeah. it's going to be published hopefully beginning of next year in English. Okay, um, and so this is now the main goal for the coming years. Uh, so I really want to draw the attention of the public in general, but certainly also of policymakers on Africa. Um, because I think it's an underestimated um, dimension of our planet. Mm. Um, what is happening in, in Africa is incredible. The, the demographic growth uh, leads to uh, a need for additional jobs which are not there. So that might lead to, um, yeah, to real huge problems in Africa. And so I think we have a responsibility towards Africa. Um, I also want that people understand that uh, we should not only look at Africa in a negative way. Uh, there are many fantastic things happening in Africa. So uh, yes, that's my my ambition for the next years uh, to really focus uh, on on Africa and um, yeah, try to convince public and policymakers of the need to have a to look differently at Africa. The future is Africa. For Europe, certainly. Huh? Mm -hmm. that perhaps that's not the case for, for, for other continents, but for Europe, certainly uh, the future is Africa. And we completely underestimate this. It's our neighbor. I'm truly touched. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, I hope I hope you can inspire a lot of people with um, with this podcast and to make just this little change in, in, in their mind and to see. Um, and I, I fully acknowledge I've been working in Africa as well, so I I hope, that's why I feel the the, the, the spirit of uh, of your engagement so beautiful. Um, is there maybe one last piece of advice that you can that you would like to share with um, with the audience? To I think that um, yeah. um, being driven by real purpose is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what makes life interesting. Um, and whichever position you are, um, I think that uh, purpose is so important. Not routine, but purpose. Uh, that would be my last. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Luik, for this fascinating conversation. I, I truly enjoyed it, enjoyed it. And I wish you all success with your book. Thank you very and, much. And uh, I also want to thank the listener. And I hope uh, also for the listener, this conversation has been very inspiring. And because that is my mission, uh, after yeah. all, my purpose is to bring inspirational people yeah. and bring uh, inspiration to all of you. Because personal development and growth are key elements in a changing world. And if yeah. you, dear listener, want to learn to listen to more podcasts, just press the follow up button and you will be informed immediately. Okay. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much for listening to Studio Stain. If you want more inspiration, just go to my website studiostain.com or go to the Spotify website iTunes on inspirational leadership. 
You can also share this podcast with others who might benefit from listening to these inspirational talks. Thank you very much. Great people.